Hi everyone, it's Dr. Art Epstein. I'm really excited uh, to be participating in CE Wire 2022. Uh, I don't know how many years I've been uh, speaking at CE Wire, but uh, it's been extremely gratifying to see how this program has evolved uh, into one of the foremost providers of continuing education. Uh, and I congratulate uh, Adam Farkas, Paul Farkas, and Steve Silverberg for the amazing job that they're doing. Today I'm going to be speaking on avoiding mistakes in dry eye management, uh, something near and dear to my heart. Uh, as many of you probably know, uh, I focus primarily on dry eye and ocular surface disease, actually almost exclusively uh, uh, in that area. And uh, one of the ways that uh, I've grown the practice and certainly increased my ability to help patients is by recognizing my own mistakes and uh, dealing with them. Uh, so uh, I think it's important that we examine the common mistakes we made, many of them uh, which I've made myself, uh, to better understand uh, the disease state and how we can effectively manage it. Of course, uh, the obligatory uh, disclosures. Um, you know, this is required by COPE, uh, and I've been extremely fortunate uh, to have a um, you know, number of companies that have supported uh, research, uh, educational programs, uh, um, allowed me to speak on their behalf, uh, and as well uh, as uh, sometimes taken my advice. Not always, uh, but uh, I'm always uh, good about uh, offering uh, advice and, and uh, counsel. We're going to have uh, uh, an opportunity to uh, interact uh, during these programs, so you can certainly ask questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, if we miss anything or you have any questions afterwards, the best way to reach me is by email. Uh, Art Epstein at uh, Art Epstein uh, I'm sorry, or at Epstein at gmail.com. I have too many email addresses, uh, unfortunately. And uh, or at Epstein at gmail.com with the subject of CEY or 2022. Uh, so your uh, email doesn't get lost in uh, what is a crush uh, of uh, the God knows how many emails I receive on a, on a daily basis. So the premise of this uh, presentation is that uh, dry eye is among the most misunderstood and confusing of all clinical areas in eye care. And uh, there are reasons for that. Um, one of them is that we don't focus on outcomes. We basically uh, sometimes do things um, simply because we have always done it that way. Uh, some of the concepts we use are just frankly incorrect and dated, but yet uh, some of us hold on to them for dear life. Uh, sometimes we have ideas that are conflicting and make little sense. Uh, there is no doubt that there is commercial influence. Many of the programs even today uh, with standards for commercial support uh, somehow get uh, influenced by uh, you know, commercial interest. Not always for the worse. You know, I think uh, it's important that we recognize uh, you know, the support we've gotten from industry over the years, certainly in optometry, which has allowed us to advance uh, to the extent that we've, you know, uh, advanced over the last 50 years. Uh, we have a new issue uh, today, you know, who's the expert and who is an influencer who really doesn't know very much uh, and dabbles uh, in an area rather than is immersed in it. Uh, you know, are there financial concerns? In other words, do we do things because there are financial incentives to do so? And we have to fess up to it. And uh, the other issue that I think is especially true in dry eye is that uh, poor outcomes when these patients are not ma well managed uh, can be aversive. You know, we want to avoid these patients, and uh, that's kind of unfortunate uh, both for us and the patient. We're literally. Um, overwhelmed with the number of different elements that constitutes what we now kind of lump together as dry eye. Uh, and despite trying to change the name and, and really change the focus, you know, you see so many things desiccating stress. Is it blepharitis, meibomian gland dysfunction, lacrimal functional unit, tear instability, epiphora, 
uh, conjunctival cholesis, mechanical dry eye? Is it MMP9 that's causing it? Is it uh, osmolarity? Is it, and on and on and on. And I think uh, it's important that we recognize that this is a very, very complex issue. The way I look at it, uh, and the way I've organized it in this course, uh, is using an integrative approach that basically takes this complex jigsaw puzzle, uh, and many of the parts, you know, many of the things that I just mentioned uh, a second ago are apropos and relevant, but you know, how do they fit together and, and how can we use them to come up with a cohesive approach to managing patient issues uh, and uh, you know, helping those patients? You know, again, if we just grab randomly, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, we're not going to be very successful because things follow one another and things work synergistically. One of the things that uh, I've learned to do is uh, approach things from what I call an originalist uh, perspective. Uh, and uh, honestly, I was kind of motivated to analyze what I was doing by uh, some of the issues that were going on in Supreme Court jurisprudence. And I know you're probably thinking I'm a bit of a nut uh, that I'm interested in Supreme Court jurisprudence, among many other kind of interesting and odd things. Uh, and in Supreme Court juris jurisprudence, uh, the originalist approach really uh, you know, can, I guess, most commonly be traced to Antonin Scalia, who has passed away a couple of years ago, and several justices that are on the court now. Uh, and it's the belief that the U.S. Constitution must be interpreted based on the original intent of the authors, that the document is, is you know, fixed and sacrosanct. Uh, and it is determined by examining the evidence of the author's understanding of the meaning and its wording and its historical context, not something that you would interpret based on what you think uh, is appropriate today. Uh, and again, this is not meant to be a political statement. Please don't take it that way, but you know, we can learn pretty much from everything around us. In the context of dry eye, it is a clinical approach that identifies the original intent or purpose of the oculus surface environment, its components and behaviors, to better understand its underlying engineering and purpose. When function is understood, this function can be recognized and strategies to restore homeostasis initiated. In other words, you have to go back to the origins of the species and try to understand why we uh, evolved with tears. You know, why wasn't the eye dry? Certainly would have been a lot easier. Well, that's an obvious uh, answer to an obvious question. It's for visual. Uh, reasons, and certainly there are also protective reasons as well. Uh, but those things are important when you uh, sit and ponder why a patient is experiencing what they're experiencing. Sometimes it's very, very helpful to uh, go back to the beginning and try to understand why a system works the way it does in order to fix it when it's broken. So the following are uh, common mistakes uh, in dry eye management uh, and management of oculus surface disease in general. Uh, as I said before, many of which you know I've made and, and, and learned from along the way. And uh, for me, since we opened the Dry Eye Center of Arizona uh, about eight years ago, it's been an incredible journey. Uh, we'll look at why they're mistakes and how we can avoid, uh, and most importantly, how we can fix them. You know, so learning from them and fixing them are really key elements. Mistake number one, and this is you know where I started, and I think where all of us started not that long ago, thinking you can effectively treat dry eye by using just artificial tears. And while artificial tears can be helpful, they are not curative or therapeutic really in any way, with the rarest, rarest of exceptions. So the key here is understanding that dry eye really isn't necessarily dry, and not every dry eye is dry. Not every patient needs or benefits from artificial tears. It's not as if you should reflexively hand someone a bottle of wet and usher them out the door simply because you've diagnosed dry eye. You need to understand what the root cause of the problem is. Uh, and uh, in some cases, I've actually had patients, in fact, as recently as, as last week, uh, who have, you know, again, under the umbrella of dry eye, which is a rather broad and, and somewhat defective umbrella, uh, you know, they had dry eye or would be diagnosed appropriately with dry eye, but really had no need for artificial tears, was using them very minimally. Uh, also, when you are prescribing artificial tears, they've evolved tremendously. They're very, very different in their formulations. Uh, 
uh, especially in the last year or two, the, the science has advanced dramatically. And this is not something that should be prescribed haphazardly. You shouldn't be recommending or prescribing artificial tears uh, with specific intent after you uh, look at outcomes of what you've uh, uh, recommended in the past for patients who have known diagnosis and you understand the underlying cause of their disease. And keep in mind, that we really fully don't understand exactly what artificial tears do, that they may cause down-regulation of normal ocular surface functions. For example, a lipid-based artificial tear could cause down-regulation of lipid production. Uh, it's within the realm of possibility. It's something we don't, unfortunately, fully understand at this point. Mistake number two uh, is believing, you know, almost reflexively, that dry eyes are actually dry. Uh, in my practice, and again, in one of the driest areas of the country, essentially limited to dry eye, the overwhelming majority of patients who come in don't really have dry eyes, although you know they do fall under that umbrella. Dry eye is a dysfunction of the tears rather than a lack of tears. And that's where I usually start when I educate patients. Here's your eye, it ain't dry. Uh, and it's important to recognize that uh, aqueous insufficiency uh, can be associated with evaporation, and it's very difficult to judge which is which, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, so we have patients who can be tear deficient. You know, there are patients who have um, a number of diseases that reduce in, uh, or that reduce tear production, rather, uh, and uh, all of those patients almost always have some element of dysfunction. In fact, uh, I uh, propose that you look at a typical Sjogren's patient. How are you going to fix the underlying aqueous deficiency of Sjogren's? Basically stabilize the tear film as best you can, which is one of the strategies that uh, can effectively work uh, on uh, helping those patients, or work uh, for helping those patients, rather. Uh, and it's important not to just dive into this, you know, dry eye is a disease of aqueous insufficiency that the patient's eyes are actually dry because you'll end up, uh, you know, just using artificial tears and punctal plugs and never get to address the root cause of the patient's problem. Mistake number three is um, really a, a, a serious one, and we're guilty of it sometimes because uh, in most practices, dry eye is just one of the things that you uh, do, uh, and uh, we often don't listen uh, to the patients, and we often don't hear what they say. Uh, I like to say the patient is the most sensitive instrument we have in the office, and indeed they are. They have a good sense of uh, severity of their problem. Uh, as well as the chronicity of it, you know, how long it's been going on, how much it's uh, creating issues in their life, uh, and they can color it for you so you really can understand. Uh, patients will often uh, tell me, um, you know, that they wake up in the morning and their eyes feel like sandpaper. I know almost immediately that exposure is uh, part of the clinical picture. And the other issue is when you interact with a patient and uh, talk to them about their problem, uh, the uh, trust and you know the validation of their choice of you as a clinician uh, is reinforced. So it's a very very important uh, aspect of patient management. Now uh, another mistake is again I kind of alluded to this before, just accepting that dry eye is an aqueous deficiency. Uh, uh, or that aqueous deficiency and evaporative dry eye really exist uh, in isolation or really exist in, uh, in, in, in the wild, in the real world. And the reality is that the two exist within a continuum. Uh, evaporative function is variable and uh, depends upon the environment and a number of other factors, uh, meibomian gland production. Uh, you can have a patient that has a um, you know, relatively uh, normal aqueous layer, but relatively limited uh, lipid layer thickness, and they're going to have significant evaporation. So, you know, you, you have that aspect of it, and then you have a patient that has, uh, you know, somewhat aqueous deficiency in normal lipid production, and they also have evaporative uh, issues. Uh, so this is all relative, uh, and it's all controlled by uh, homeostatic elements that we will talk about. You know, if you if you look at the typical patient, you can have a patient that you know appears to be normal, and uh, they end up in a dry environment like 
um, Denver or Phoenix uh, or Las Vegas, and suddenly they have problems because the environment now challenges systems that would normally work. The next mistake, uh, and I think it's a mistake that you know many of us do. I certainly did for a long time, largely because I didn't uh, understand a lot of things. You know, I've learned a lot of things over the last uh, eight years, especially over the last uh, two. One of the um, I don't want to say blessings because there's nothing blessed about COVID, but it's concentrated much more complex patients and it's forced me to really spend a lot of time thinking about what's going on. But the eye is so critical for survival that it's one of the most complex organ systems. Uh, and, you know, we underestimate it. We think it's simple. And that kind of goes back to what we talked about just a second ago, you know, the use of artificial tears reflexively and uh, punctal plugs and things that are, you know, really not focused on addressing the root cause of, of underlying problems. We forget uh, that the eye is uh, completely controlled uh, through neurologic mechanisms. In fact, we learned that the cornea has, you know, 100 to 200 times the density of nerves that of any other tissue in the body. But for some reason, we never ask why. What, what are those nerves there for? It wasn't as if there were you know, an excessive amount of nerves hanging around and, uh, you know, uh, the cornea just volunteered for those extra nerves. Uh, the cornea is basically a sensory array and uh, part of a system that uh, is constantly measuring the effects of elements to maintain ocular surface function. And we'll talk about uh, homeostasis in more detail. One of the things that I think we overlook is that what we're aware of is just a small fraction of the data uh, that's uh, being transmitted to the brain. You know, for example, uh, you know, it's like a modern car. Uh, you know, if I was to pull the uh, wiring harness out of the computer and hand it to you, you would probably have little idea that, uh, you know, differential wheel speed is being measured or uh, certainly you know that uh, brake pad thickness is being measured because when your brakes begin to wear, instead of getting the metal-on-metal metal squealing, you would get a warning light um, before uh, any damage occurred. But you probably wouldn't realize that the computer was measuring uh, the potential for a skid by looking at the differential speed between different wheels and adjusting by applying the brakes, completely unbeknownst to the driver. Uh, and that's a simple system, you know, compared to what I suspect is going on in the eye. And what we don't know, we don't know. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there's a lot to know that we will discover as time goes on. But the amount of uh, information that's being uh, uh, sent to the brain that we're aware of is just a fraction of the information, whether it's, uh, you know, turning on my Bohmian glands or the amount of lipid in the tear film or the stiction and friction uh, factors or evaporation or, you know, relative temperature and a host of other things that, you know, we don't have conscious awareness of. But those things need to be kept uh, in mind because they are critical to understanding uh, the ocular surface environment and how it's maintained. One of the things that is, you know, somewhat frustrating to me is uh, Kelly Nichols was absolutely brilliant in including the concept of homeostasis in uh, the most recent, I think it was uh, 2017, dues uh, definition. And unfortunately, I think we pay a lot of lip service to homeostasis. We don't really understand what it means in the eye. Uh, and homeostasis is an active, continuous, complex interaction uh, with and reaction to endogenous and exogenous challenges to normal ocular surface function. Basically, homeostasis uh, is what keeps all of these systems working uh, and in balance, and it is something that is constantly working. So the ocular surface uh, is in constant uh, dynamic flux. We often don't realize that. We think we could you know, measure tear production by using a Schirmer strip, but tear production changes from moment to moment. Osmolarity changes from moment to moment. Uh, and uh, lipid layer thickness and lipid layer production, <clears throat> excuse me, changes from moment to moment. Uh, dry eye is almost, almost always directly caused by or associated with homeostatic control failure. When we look at homeostasis, this is a very simplistic, uh, uh, I guess, schematic of you know, homeostasis. Uh, and it's all about um, 
production of an action uh, and measurement of the response to an action. But keep in mind that the aqueous surface environment has multiple hundreds of different actions and reactions going on simultaneously. And uh, the complexity is almost mind-boggling. Uh, and uh, it's what keeps the eye functioning, you know, despite incredible variation in environment, uh, as well as uh, changes over time with age, uh, with chronicity, with failure of systems. Uh, and it's all about writing the ship. It's all about maintaining function. Uh, and for the most part, if you understand what the original design parameters are, it's uh, primarily visual function, but also maintaining isolation from an extremely uh, challenging and harsh environment that we're often subjected to. Mistake number seven is thinking that dry eye is inflammation. And many of us, just like we prescribe uh, artificial tears reflexively without much thought, we also prescribe anti-inflammatory agents, uh, you know, to the point where restasis uh, is a, a billion dollar a year product. The question is, what percentage of patients actually have inflammation. Most dry eye is caused by homeostatic dysfunction or control failure. Uh, you know, it's as simple as that. I can tell you that in my practice, we do obviously prescribe anti-inflammatory drugs, but not as often as you think. In fact, considerably less often than you would imagine. Inflammation occurs from uh, homeostatic control failure. In other words, when the body can't right itself, it will call forth inflammation. It doesn't like to because it's hard to control inflammation. But we also see a significant subset of patients who have autoimmune disease or systemic inflammatory disease. You know, we have patients who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, who have very severe dry eye. We have patients who have rheumatoid arthritis who have absolutely no eye effects. Uh, inflammation is, you know, very, very nonspecific and, and does whatever it wants. That's one of the problems with inflammation. Uh, if you've ever had the experience of uh, um, prescribing a steroid uh, or one of the more advanced, you know, modern uh, anti-inflammatories like lefitograst or cyclosporin and they don't seem to work with a patient, uh, it may be because the patient doesn't really have inflammation. What they have is homeostatic control failure. Mistake number eight is ignoring anatomy and physiology and understanding function and dysfunction. You know, it's important that you understand that you uh, are treating uh, patients' problems with things that have specific uh, activity and specific function. And I think we all do understand at some level, but maybe not uh, well enough to be able to describe it to a patient, which I think is important because it empowers them to uh, be compliant uh, and it's important to think about what you're doing. In other words, why are you going to prescribe lefitograst? Well, the patient has inflammation and I want to uh, target uh, the surface to prevent adhesion uh, of uh, T cells uh, to, through ICAM uh, and lefitograst, you know, at least theoretically does exactly that and clinically uh, it can uh, be very, very effective in mitigating inflammation. Uh, this is particularly prone in IPL. Uh, you know, uh, when Rolando Toyos first recognized that uh, IPL was very effective uh, at um, improving uh, dry eye symptoms, he uh, would express patients afterwards. I suspect he believed that IPL was producing significant heat at the level of the meibomian glands, which it doesn't. There's virtually no heat uh, produced at the meibomian glands using a Toyos approach, basically a facial application. Uh, so you're doing cold expression, which hurts like like hell, and uh, something that you know I would avoid and do avoid like the plague. I don't do expression uh, after IPL. Uh, and also on eyelid IPL is another issue that I think a lot of us have gravitated to without a lot of thought. We don't treat eyelids directly unless we're treating a chalazia or hordeolum or some you know, vascular lid abnormality. And the reason why is look at the anatomy. Uh, IPL applies energy typically filtered uh, at uh, 560 to 590 nanometers. It's basically green spectrum light. Originally, it was designed to uh, target abnormal vessels in rosacea, which uh, those vessels absorb uh, light of that spectrum and, uh, you know, essentially are, are cauterized or 
uh, absorb most of the energy and, and minimized. Uh, and when we apply it to the eyelid, we have this gigantic, thick obicularis muscle, which is red. And if you've ever shined red light on something green, it basically uh, absorbs it almost completely. The result is black. So very little light gets through. In addition, the tarsal plate, uh, where the meibomian glands are buried, uh, is a dense, uh, very reflective tissue. So the amount of energy that gets through to the meibomian glands is, is relatively small. In contrast, when applied uh, to the face using a, a Toyos-like approach or the approach we use, you end up generating a wave that actually uh, you know, propagates on a plane that does get to the meibomian glands quite effectively. So uh, is there a, a use for on eyelid treatment? Absolutely, it can be very, very helpful uh, for a number of conditions, but if you're looking uh, to improve meibomian gland function, that's not uh, the most efficient or effective way. Well, the next mistake, which I think uh, is uh, extremely common, and I wish it wasn't because it does impact uh, a lot of clinicians who really want to achieve success in managing these patients is that there's a lot of uh, patients that have uh, significant nocturnal uh, exposure. Uh, their lids don't uh, close completely. Uh, the image uh, at the top is a normal looking young person. And if you look closely, and, and again, not a particularly large image, but I can tell you there's significant lid gap. I just saw a gentleman uh, on Friday uh, and uh, he, I could have driven a, a small car through the amount of lid gap he had uh, that was missed. Most of these patients will tell you uh, when you ask them that, you know, they wake up in the morning, they, they barely can get their eyes open. Sometimes they have to manually assist to get their eyes open, or they wake up in the middle of the night putting drops in. Uh, now, uh, the baby image below uh, reminds me that babies sometimes sleep with their eyes open and you know they rarely have any issues except for the parents getting neurotic and you know saying is this a problem and you know I'm very concerned or oh, my baby looks like they're possessed babies can sleep with their eyes open because they have extremely stable tear film so this is not only an issue of evaporation or or surface damage due to uh, uh, exposure directly but an unstable tear film uh, will uh, exacerbate it. And I suspect there are plenty of patients that sleep with their eyes uh, cracked slightly who have stable tear films that really have no symptoms. We don't see them as dry eye patients, so we don't get to intercede. And this needs to be treated uh, with uh, either a mask uh, or more uh, commonly for us at this point is we use either a paraffin-based ointment, uh, which is Hilo Night, or we'll use Sika San, which is uh, something available from Amazon, which is uh, a gel uh, with significant viscosity that's protective. The next mistake, number 10, is prescribing something without knowing uh, how and why it should work, which is you know, very similar to uh, what I had uh, you know, described before, except uh, this comes directly from my interaction with a patient. This young lady came in uh, from you know, fairly far away, uh, you know, plane ride, um, you know, for management, and uh, she had gone to a, a local doctor who was, you know, reasonably astute, uh, and he had literally, it's almost as if he had a, a bucket filled with darts, closed his eyes, reached in, grabbed a dart, and threw it blindly against the wall, and uh, this poor young lady was essentially covered with darts uh, with different medications and different treatments, none of which really added up and made any sense at all. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, reached out to me later and wanted me to prescribe something. Um, and again, I don't want to get into the psychology of the situation, but, uh, you know, I explained that I wasn't going to prescribe it and that, you know, we have a clear path that, you know, she felt comfortable with. And if she didn't, then perhaps I wasn't the right clinician for her. And she quickly realized that, you know, I had her best interests in mind. So always understand, you know, the science of what you're prescribing, its mechanism of action, you know, as I said before, understand how the these things work uh, at a level where you can explain it to a patient. Uh, always have an expectation of what you're going to get when you prescribe something or do a procedure. Uh, have a backup plan. I think, you know, iteratively, iteratively rather, you know, way out. Uh, if this doesn't work, then, you know, will this work? Will this work? Will this work? Will this work? Uh, these days, especially, you know, you'll go online and you'll see a colleague who will give you their recipe. And, you know, it, it, you get consensus and then that's kind of overwhelming, you get drawn into using things that don't even make sense. And the most important thing is literally test 
every single thing you do, you know, every time you prescribe something, see how it works, see why it works, see why it didn't work. And the most important takeaway from, you know, this mistake is an effective treatment plan is a process. It's not a product-driven issue. You know, it's not a product-driven approach. It's a process-driven approach. Mistake number 11, using punctal plugs routinely. And uh, I had uh, a great ophthalmologist, um, you know, cornea specialist who got tired of seeing dry eye, and he would refer uh, all of his dry eye patients to me. And every single patient came in with uh, punctal plugs. And, uh, you know, finally, uh, at some uh, meeting we had, I said, hey, would you mind not plugging these patients because, frankly, um, you know, a lot of them are uncomfortable. I'm pulling the plugs out. Uh, and he said, sure, sure, but the plugs never stop being plugged. I'm not sure why um, uh, he was plugging everyone, although, you know, I have, you know, some suspicion that, you know, he believed that uh, this is what you do with a dry eye patient, and, you know, certainly there's reimbursement for punctal plugs, but I will tell you that in a dry eye, essentially only practice, um, I, I think I've used plugs maybe once in the last five years, and we have you know, obviously, because um, we're still around, a lot of very, very successful patients. I'm not saying plugs are inappropriate for every single patient, but if you look at um, dry eye and uh, ocular surface function uh, in a contemporary way, you recognize that it's not a lack of tears. It's not tear deficiency, uh, but rather tear dysfunction. And uh, plugging an active system that's there for a very specific reason. You know, it's not passive drainage. This is active drainage that occurs as part of the blink mechanism. So it's part of this complex ballet of, of motion and function. And just plugging uh, a puncta, especially both punctas, just, you know, craziness, uh, you end up uh, creating more problems and the eye works around it because the other puncta takes over more. So uh, it makes little sense for the majority of patients for me. And now I'm not saying that, you know, you should never use plugs. And I know there's uh, some, you know, well-known people whose, you know, opinions I, you know, have some trust for who use plugs as a primary approach. But, you know, I'm not seeing that patient population and I think you really should ask yourself uh, why you're using plugs and if they're really making a difference. And, and admittedly, they do for a short period of time, but usually not for uh, any uh, protracted period. Likewise, one of the you know uh, frustrating things for me is that occasionally I'll get a colleague who'll walk up uh, during a lecture. Well, not that people walk up during lectures these days because we don't have that many in-person lectures. Uh, but, you know, we'll come and say, you know, I, I don't understand that I've used, you know, amniotic membrane. You know, I use three of them and the patient still has dry eye. Of course, because amniotic membrane is amazingly good for treating ocular surface disease, but not every single patient that has, you know, quote unquote dry eye has an ocular surface disease component. So that's, you know, an important uh, differentiator. Uh, I will say that cryopreserved uh, amniotic membrane does have regenerative and uh, uh, neurotrophic treatment properties. So there's more to that than meets the eye, if you will. But if you're just using uh, an amniotic membrane, especially a dry membrane under a lens as a treatment for dry eye, again, without thinking of how it works or why it works, uh, it's not going to be a very, very successful approach. Uh, one of the things that I find, you know, quite interesting uh, is that, um, you know, a lot of patients will come in and they'll complain of tearing. Uh, and I know a lot of my colleagues, you know, completely perplexed by it. I, they understand that, that, you know, tearing is something that occurs in, you know, again, quote unquote, dry eye. But I don't think they really have given it a lot of thought, so they can't really explain it to the patient. And I always uh, explain to the patient that there's two different systems involved in maintaining, you know, the ocular surface. Uh, there's reflex tearing and there is uh, basal tearing. And basal tears are constant tears that are always there. And their primary function is to create a perfectly smooth surface so that your ancestors could see well enough to avoid predators and, and find food, you know, is a very strong uh, uh, survival, uh, you know, advantage. Uh, and reflex tears uh, are, exist because, you know, our ancestors didn't have sinks and soap or nail clippers uh, and putting their grungy hand in their eye to get a piece of volcanic ash out would scratch their cornea and then, you know, that would be, a, you know, essentially a death sentence. So 
Uh, the reason why they're tearing is because the brain is interpreting the problems that they're having caused by their quote-unquote dry eye uh, as something that needs to be washed away. And once you explain that to a patient, you know, there's this aha moment. Uh, and indeed, if you can get rid of the underlying uh, cause for this excessive tearing, uh, then you can certainly be successful. And, you know, again, you have to make sure that, uh, you know, the drainage system is functional and working well, but most of these patients could be managed by, you know, addressing their, you know, dry eye issues, if you will. The next mistake is uh, thinking that steroids uh, are a, uh, you know, great long-term solution for dry eye management. Uh, and uh, I uh, have had the, you know, sad experience of having uh, patients that have found their way to the office, sometimes referred, sometimes uh, coming on their own, uh, who you know at this point have already had dense cataracts because they've been on a steroid for a long, long period of time. So uh, you know, steroids, you know, for most patients are okay, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But long-term topical steroid use, especially when it's unmonitored. Uh, it can be very, very dangerous. And, uh, you know, the patient I just referred to, uh, you know, a minute ago uh, is a patient that um, uh, ended up having cataract surgery at, in her 40s, you know, and that's, you know, that's, you know, just, you know, terrible. But even worse is the patient uh, who's a steroid responder and that's not discovered. Uh, and uh, the patient ends up, you know, with a massive amount of cupping and, you know, eventually goes on and has, uh, you know, severe glaucoma with, with vision loss. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, I think we really need to be, uh, you know, cognizant of. I'm not saying, you know, again, uh, never say never when it comes to steroids, but uh, you need to be aware of it and conscious and, and careful. Uh, and the flip side of that, and I think, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, a very, very important, uh, um, you know, uh, element, if you will, uh, is um, avoiding steroids because you're afraid of them. And, and I know this is an issue because, you know, I've heard from uh, reps, for example, when uh, a newer steroid was introduced that some of our colleagues just, you know, uh, completely avoid steroids because they think, you know, horrible things are going to happen from a medical legal point of view or the patient's going to have a bad outcome. The reality is that, number one, steroids today are, you know, better than they were, uh, you know, five years ago or ten years ago. So we've had, you know, some major advances in uh, making steroids safer to use, and if monitored properly, uh, they can be used uh, to uh, minimize, especially flares. You know, when many patients, you know, uh, have uh, exacerbations. You know, they they have like a baseline level, and then uh, suddenly, you know, the environment changes, uh, seasons change. You know, they're now inside more, and the, you know, the heat's on in the in the northeast. Uh, or, you know, in Arizona, uh, you know, the heat's on out, outdoors uh, in the summer and, uh, you know, or allergens crop in and their eyes are just really irritated. You know, dry eye patients have relatively low dilutional reserve and, and they just, you know, just suddenly become extremely miserable. That can be controlled by a steroid. And in fact, it's an empowerment strategy as long as you explain how to use the steroid. Uh, use a steroid that has minimal risk. You know, we now have a steroid that's approved by the FDA for the management of dry eye. Uh, it certainly can be a very, very helpful adjunct. It's not for every patient. You know, for patients who have these uh, exacerbations, though, uh, it can be extremely, extremely helpful. Uh, the next mistake is, is kind of an, an interesting one. And, you know, again, I kind of go back to IPL because it's, you know, it's very easy to see the uh, issues here, you know, if you will. You know, it's kind of very glaring. Uh, and that is uh, you have to understand the economics of what you do. Uh, dry eye uh, practice is very different than general practice. It takes more time. Uh, it uh, can be much more complex. The interaction with the patient can be uh, in greater depth. Uh, there's more educational aspects. There's more emotional content for many patients. There are other aspects, uh, certainly of eye care, that are similar to that. But if you're not uh, making a living, you know, if you're not, uh, you know, profitable, you're not going to be successful clinically. Uh, and so one of the things that I realized, you know, fairly early on, 
uh, is that I needed to get IPL patients uh, in and out uh, for treatments in a relatively short period of time. When we first started, you know, we booked a patient for a half an hour and I discovered I was spending, you know, even in the beginning when I was, you know, still perfecting my technique and learning, uh, I was spending at least 10 minutes, you know, twiddling my thumbs. And, you know, that doesn't make sense, especially on a day where you're doing a lot of these procedures. And that's what we did. We actually created a day, we carved out a day for me where that's all I was doing, you know, and, and thankfully I have an associate and now we kind of split it up and we're doing more of them. Uh, and th the logic behind it is this, you know, I, I realized that we could get this done in 15 minutes. And, you know, so we uh, orchestrated it and organized it. My tech was able to prepare the patient very quickly. Uh, even a new patient that needed an informed consent and, and skin typing, we still could get a patient in and out in 15 minutes. Uh, for the new patient, a little bit rushed, but, you know, for the existing patient, certainly, a, you know, a comfortable amount of time. Uh, and this included everything, you know, little we prepped, you know, the uh, application of uh, uh, shields and uh, of ultrasound gel, uh, and uh, as well as clean up at the completion. And we were able to do four patients an hour. Uh, and then when uh, people started talking about uh, laser grade on eye shields, uh, I began to look at that. Uh, and uh, we do use it, by the way, uh, for patients that have chalasia, uh, hordeola, you know, abnormal uh, vasculature of the lids sometimes, uh, you know, basically rosacea of the uh, uh, external lids, um, you know, it's appropriate. Uh, and this is, you know, this is something that my good friend Laura Perriman does. And, you know, again, she sees a special subset of patients, and I think she probably spends more time because she also treats for general rosacea as well. But I calculated pretty quickly that we added about, you know, three to four minutes uh, every uh, time we used an on-eye laser grade shield. Plus, you know, we, we bought a bunch of uh, those shields. Anyway, I did the math, uh, and if I take an average of three and a half minutes, so four times that is about, you know, 15 minutes, give or take, which basically causes the loss of one procedure per hour uh, or eight procedures a day, maybe not quite eight, but, you know, seven. Uh, and let's say you charge a thousand dollars, you know, and again, that's a number out of my hat. That's not what I charge. Um, but let's say you, you know, you charge uh, a thousand. If it's eight procedures, you know, you're losing uh, $2,000 a day because you're doing four treatments typically. And uh, so, you know, uh, some of those patients will be uncharged for that day, you know, so you're charging, you know, a thousand for a four treatment package. But you get the picture, you know, you're talking about a significant economic loss, which makes it very difficult to uh, offer uh, a procedure, uh, you know, effectively, if you're not making enough money to justify the cost of the uh, technology and uh, the ability to perform the procedure itself. The next mistake, number 17, uh, is forgetting to check corneal sensitivity on dry eye patients. You know, we uh, check corneal sensitivity in a number of different cases. You know, for example, a patient that, you know, has herpes keratitis, we want to differentiate uh, in part because they become hypostatic. Uh, but we don't typically do it, at least most of us, I, I think, don't typically do it on certainly not all of our dry eye patients. Uh, and, um, you know, sometimes we don't do it even when we have a perplexing dry eye patient. And the reason for doing it is the ocular surface is extremely complex. It's under neural control. The cornea has more nerves than any other tissue in the body. Those nerves serve a function. Uh, neurotrophic keratitis, you know, again, beyond the um, you know, context of this uh, presentation, uh, but uh, is, uh, can be associated with dry eye. In other words, the early stages of it can present very much like dry eye. Uh, neurogenic dry eye, which is something that, you know, I've described in past presentations and uh, I think we need to be increasingly aware of. In other words, dry eye that's caused by, uh, you know, abnormal innervation uh, needs to be uh, identified. And one way of doing it is looking at uh, corneal sensitivity. So either do this routinely or when you uh, have a diagnosis, it doesn't seem to make sense. As an example, I had a uh, patient uh, actually last week. Uh, it was a very productive week for interesting patients. Uh, and this woman was referred by a uh, colleague uh, 
uh, who uh, just didn't want to deal with this patient. I, you know, she told me that, you know, she's been treated, uh, you know, by her ophthalmologist, and you know, she went for a second opinion, and uh, that doctor, you know, sent her to me after seeing her. Uh, her vision, in, if I remember correctly, the left eye was 2400. It was about 2040 in the right eye. Uh, you know, looking at uh, non-invasive breakup time, where placido rings are uh, projected onto the cornea, her eye was just distorted as can be, uh, you know, almost trashed, and, uh, you know, by the time, uh, and her breakup time was, you know, just absolutely miserable. Uh, by the time I stained her and put her uh, in front of a slit lamp, she had incredibly dense staining, you know, she had, you know, suffered some damage. There was, you know, just a haziness because of inflammation, uh, and, um, you know, she had relatively little pain, you know, so she wasn't uncomfortable. She said when she was out in the sun, she was light sensitive. It didn't add up. Uh, you know, when you have that much uh, corneal disturbance, these patients should barely be able to keep their eyes open, which is, you know, a common a common finding. Uh, and in her case, it wasn't there. So uh, check corneal sensitivity. Sure enough, she was neurotrophic. Uh, and the diagnosis was neurotrophic keratitis. So it was an early a relatively early presentation of neurotrophic keratitis that had been, you know, kind of managed or mismanaged as, as dry eye, uh, and had many of the same symptoms uh, of dry eye. But the way to have uh, established a diagnosis was uh, by looking at corneal sensitivity. Uh, and you know, there are some patients who would have the dense staining and still would have relatively intact, maybe somewhat diminished, uh, you know, corneal sensitivity. Uh, but here, it was a, a direct uh, key to uh, treatment. Now, the question is, how do you treat a patient like that? Well, one way certainly would be uh, to use an amniotic membrane because it works so well uh, for corneal staining. But in her case, everything was relatively stable. Uh, we decided to put her on Oxervate. Uh, um, to help regenerate the nerves. We've had phenomenal success with that. Uh, and uh, other than uh, essentially foundational, you know, uh, uh, baseline treatment, which we instituted just, you know, to maintain a normal, uh, healthier ocular surface, we didn't really uh, do anything else, just waiting for the Oxivate to uh, go through its prior uh, authorization process. Uh, and that's how you would treat a patient like that. Again, uh, larger because we, you know, looked at corneal sensitivity and confirmed the diagnosis. Uh, a lot of us, you know, tend to buy into things, and uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we want we we all want a simple way, you know, like a a, a, a litmus paper test for uh, dry eye. You know, we'd like uh, to be able to, uh, you know, flash something into the patient's eye or put a dipstick in or something like that and say, oh, yep, the patient has dry eye. Uh, and, um, you know, the reality is there really is nothing uh, that is 100% absolute uh, in terms of uh, diagnosing uh, whether or not a patient has dry eye. Osmolarity uh, is certainly useful. We use it in clinical trials uh, all the time. Uh, but is that something that uh, um, is a good way of uh, fully understanding uh, whether or not a patient uh, has dry eye. And, you know, my experience is that it's not. Uh, now, I know some colleagues, you know, would, would uh, insist to the otherwise, but we don't typically do this routinely. Uh, and the reason why is osmolarity uh, can change when the tear foam becomes abnormal, either through evaporation or, or lack of aqueous production. Uh, and what happens is the dilutional reserve changes uh, because of you know, homeostatic failure. So, uh, and it, it doesn't tell you why. It doesn't give you any insight into the actual reason why. Uh, is it something that some people do and find helpful? Yeah. Do I think less of a person will be using it? Absolutely not. But if you're relying on it as an on-off switch for treatment or to direct you in one way or another, I don't think it's particularly helpful. The same thing with MMP9. You know, if an eye's inflamed, an eye's inflamed. You don't need to, you know, measure, uh, you know, a dipstick uh, of, yes, there is an inflammatory marker present in their tears. You can pretty much look at their eye and tell if it's inflamed or not. Uh, there are times where it can be helpful, you know, again, uh, you know, whether or not treatment is accessible, but we tend not to use it for that, unfortunately. So I tend to rely a little bit less on point of care uh, instruments than I think some do, but it's something that you really should be giving some thought to 
as to uh, you know whether or not it's helpful in your treatment uh, and diagnostic rather algorithm. The next mistake, which you know I, I think is you know kind of an interesting one, uh, is we all want the next big thing. You know we're all waiting for the next big thing, and you know the answer to the next big thing is you know what does the science say? You know LLLT is something that's been recently introduced. Uh, aside from looking kind of weird, the question is does it really work? Now some people say yeah. I mean uh, you know if you go online you'll hear uh, that it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but you know the reality is uh, it. Um, uh, it you know uh, may or may not work depending on the science, uh, which is very scant. Uh, and the problem is that patients are not very good at uh, observing uh, because they can be biased. They want things to work. So uh, you can't just go by anecdotal information. Not everything works just because someone will sell it to you. Mistake number 20, uh, being afraid to use bandage contact lenses. Now bandage contact lenses can be extremely effective for uh, severe surface disease, especially recalc recalcitrant surface disease. Uh, patients that have SPK, patients that have pain, uh, we have patients on these long-term in some cases. I would rather not. Uh, certainly there's a risk to benefit assessment that must be completed uh, and noted in your record. And patients really need to uh, get informed consent because it does increase risk of infection. Although, frankly, in you know the years I've been doing it, I've almost never seen uh, infections associated with therapeutic uh, bandage contact lenses. Uh, but patients need to be able to reach you. So that's one of the few times where I make sure that patients have my cell phone number. We live in modern times, uh, and I you know sort of alluded to this uh, before. Uh, not everything you read uh, online uh, or on the internet is true, uh, especially in healthcare. So, uh, you know, the 10 uh, steps to become famous on Facebook doesn't necessarily mean that you're an expert. You know, if you're listening to someone and, you know, and uh, following their advice, number one, is their practice, uh, you know, limited or certainly focused on uh, the area of, uh, of interest that you're listening to them uh, about. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a conversation I've had with, you know, some very notable colleagues. Uh, and in the old days, you know, you would basically, you know, pay your dues, you know, you do your research, you'd publish papers, you do book chapters. And these days, many of the people that uh, seem to be most vocal uh, on some of the uh, um, social media platforms, you know, don't necessarily have that intensity uh, focus. I'm not saying that they're not intelligent, that they're not helpful, that the advice is, is bad, nor am I saying that the communities are not helpful. I think they're absolutely wonderful. Uh, ODs on Facebook and, you know, the Oculus Surface docs and the IPL, uh, um, you know, community is extremely helpful, get a lot of information and ideas, but you have to really think about what you're hearing and test it for yourself. I think that's very important. So my, you know, final thinking is, uh, you know, this was all about uh, becoming better by learning from your own mistakes. And, you know, the things that we've covered are communicating with patients, you know, engaging with them, you know, making their problems your problems, taking it home with you. I think that's very important to understand their experience, you know. Uh, uh, patients want help. You know, we have patients breaking down and crying in the office all the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking sometimes. It's very difficult, but I don't want to sit there with a broken heart. I want to sit there and fix the patient. I don't give up. I tell them from the outset that I, I don't give up. That's my nature and that should be yours. You can help these patients. Uh, and uh, at the same time, you need to manage expectations. But you need to take calculated clinical risks in order to learn and always think about what you're doing and always think about the results. Have you made a difference in that patient's life? With that, uh, I thank you uh, for uh, your attention. I uh, thank CE Wire for uh, hosting this uh, presentation. Uh, I hopefully have answered most of your questions during the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions that were not covered, uh, artepsin at gmail.com. Please use CEWire 2022 as the subject. Thank you so much. Uh, stay healthy, stay well, uh, and hopefully I'll get to see you uh, in person uh, at a meeting uh, in the future.